Hi, Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Welcome to our video series for parents and for students. Today this video is really directed towards students. And uh, let me start by just again introducing my group. We're Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. This is our phone number and this is our Facebook address. Uh, we welcome you to friend us there if you're interested in what we're talking about and you find these these discussions helpful. Today what we want to discuss is let's see if my pen will work for me. Yes, urinary tract infections. Please realize that these discussions are not intended to replace uh, visits to your regular physician. If we can be of assistance to you here, by all means, give us a call. We'd be happy to see you in our office. If you're a student, we'd be happy for you to schedule a rotation with us to study pediatrics. What we cannot do is help you over the internet because that's just not quality medical care. So today, we're going to reference two articles. And so I'm going to list them here first. So UTI getting it right the first time by Heldrich. And it's in Contemporary Peds. And then this is an older article. The second article that's newer, on a little more, a little more up to date, and we're going to just change colors because I'm finding that color scheme annoying at best. Let's get a good color here. Goodness, these are ugly. Well, okay, let's use this. Comes from the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, subcommittee, on urinary tract infections. It's called urinary tract infection clinical practice guidelines. for the diagnosis and management. Of the initial UTI in febrile infants and children, 2 to 24 months. And this was published in Pediatrics, Two thousand eleven. Okay. So 
First, we want to look at the diagnosis of UTI. And for that, I'm going to actually go back and reference the Contemporary Pediatrics article. These two articles have different approaches to diagnosing UTI as far as what constitutes a positive culture. And I think most people are still using the older guidelines, which were published all over the place, but reviewed nicely in this Contemporary Pediatrics article back in 95. So there's multiple ways to get urine in a kid. And depending on how you obtained the urine was how we, we interpreted it. So clean catch was defined in the older guidelines as greater than 50 to 100,000 colony forming units per milliliter. Okay, and then a calf specimen was greater than a thousand units, CFUs, and then suprapubic because it went through a sterile field was any growth. In all cases, it was assumed that you were getting single organism and unless you'd been recently instrumentated or at an indwelling catheter, people definitely questioned stuff like um, uh, coag negative staph. which would include staph epidermidis and staph saprophyticus, etc. The newer guidelines require much higher colony counts to make a diagnosis of UTI, but those have not thoroughly caught on uh, among practicing pediatricians. What has caught on is what to now do when we have a child with their first Febrile UTI. Emphasis on the fact, well, you know what, before we get into that, let's back up here. Let's look at this for a second. Um, they're very clear there are three ways to obtain urine. There is a fourth way, and that's urine bags. Those are attached to the perineum of the child, and both articles are clear. Don't use them. Ever. And I can't emphasize that enough. People say, well, gee, what about if I use it and nothing grows? Well, that tells me the kid didn't have a UTI and I didn't have to cath them. Not really. You get enough betadine spilled in there from the peritoneum, you'll sterilize it. And, of course, what if something does grow? You've put off an appropriate diagnosis forever. They're always contaminated. They're useless. Please don't do it. It just makes my life impossible later on. Um, what then comes, you know, what to do for febrile UTI. So a couple of things for emphasis. First, we're dealing with the first UTI. This is not for subsequent UTI, second, third, fourth, fifth UTI. Second of all, they're febrile. This isn't a kid with just bad smelling urine. <clears throat> and third, they're infants two to 24 months. Okay, they're not six week olds. So we'll start with what to do if they're less than two months, because that's outside of the guidelines. Well, they're outside of the modern guidelines. So outside of the modern guidelines, first febrile UTI less than two months, we're going to get, um, uh, when we're done with everything, we'll treat the child. Whether we use IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics depends on how sick the kid is and how less the kid, or uh, how young the kid is. If he's less than 28 days, he gets a full septic workup that includes LP and blood culture and urine culture. And I'll reference back to my video on fever without source for the child less than 28 days. Um, He'll get IV antibiotics. And then when he's done, at some point, he'll get a total of 14 days of antibiotics. 
some of that will be done orally. And then he'll need an ultrasound of the kidneys and a VCUG. And this is a V here. Okay. For the kid less than two months of age, he doesn't necessarily need the blood culture and the urine culture as long as he's not septic appearing. And again, I referenced you back to my fever without source video. But for the UTI itself, he'll get his antibiotics however we choose to get that for 10 to 14 days. And then he'll get a VCUG and an ultrasound. For kids over two months, and this is a radical departure from what we did in the past. When I was a resident, we were trained to do VCUGs on most of these kids. But in the modern world, the recommendation is get an ultrasound of the kidneys. If it shows no scarring, and no hydronephrosis, then you're good. If it's showing evidence of kidney damage either from hydronephrosis, small kidney, renal scarring, renal anomaly, then go on and get a VCUG. What we're looking for here is high-grade reflux, so either ureteral, renal pelvicele, or high renal uh, vesicle ureteral reflux. Uh, with or without hydronephrosis. And hydrouretor. Uh, and if you're finding this, then the child needs to be referred to nephrology or to urology, depending on your community and what resources are available. Here in Reno, that's usually urology and uh, often winds up on prophylactic antibiotics, often with any reflux procedures being planned in the future. For low ureteral reflux, meaning reflux into the lower distal two-thirds of the ureter, nobody's too terribly worried about that. And certainly ureteral seals with no reflux, nobody's too terribly worried about that either. Um, again, this is for your first UTI. Now, kind of going back to the first article for a minute, the Contemporary Peds article, the next question is, what about when you're having multiple UTIs, and what is the role of the DMSA scan? And I can't pronounce what DMSA stands for, so I'm not going to try it. It's, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's a chemical that's taken up by the kidneys and excreted in the urine. It's a radio tracer, so it'll pick up cold spots in the kidneys. It'll show up as scars. Will show up as cold spots. What's the role of the DMSA scan? Well, it can be used acutely to distinguish between a lower UTI and a pyelonephritis. But since we treat them all the same, you know what the heck is the difference? Um, so the real role that we use it for is to look for scarring of the kidneys. Where do we do this? Well, if you've had multiple UTIs, if you have a UTI today and a history of a lot of OMs or streps, strep throats that were diagnosed without um, rapid straps or cultures. So if you've had a lot of OMs diagnosed in the ER or urgent cares where people maybe aren't quite so um, judicious in their use of that diagnosis, 
And if you have a patient who's been diagnosed with a lot of strep throats without history of rapid strep, a lot of those were probably UTIs, you need to go back and make sure that you haven't missed something in the form of, um, of a urinary tract infection. So this is where a DMSA that, you know, now is resulting in scarring. So this is where a DMSA scan becomes valuable to you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about antibiotics for a second. Whoops. Let me get my color back here. Ah. Okay, so antibiotics. So we now have, let's say we have a child with a positive UTI. The question is, what am I going to do with him today? We need to get him on antibiotics. Um, he need to be guided empirically with regards to what you're going to use. So, you know, your, your choices really are first generation cephalosporin, that's Keflex or cephalexin, third generation cephalosporin, that's Omnicef or um, Ceftonir. Amoxicillin. Amoxicillin with clavulonic acid. Bactrim. Macrobid which is nitrofurantoin, Bactrim is sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, and um, then fluoroquinolone. Okay. Um, and where should you start? Well, it really depends on your local sensitivity patterns. I think throughout most of the United States, amoxicillin is um, not going to be very effective. So most people are staying away from that as first-line treatment. I see a lot here on the West Coast of resistance to sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim as well. So most people, I think, would recommend staying away from that. Macrobit is not bactericidal, but rather bacteriostatic, so it's not a great first-line choice. Fluoroquinolones, although they are FDA-approved in children, are last-line drugs for everything in pediatrics, which then leaves us your first generation, third generation, and amoxicillin uh, clavulonic acid as uh, valid choices. I think most people, certainly where I trained, will start with the first generation cephalosporins. Keflex is cheap. It still has very good penetration into the urinary tract. It has um, good, spec good spectrum of coverage without being uh, broad coverage and uh, is pretty well tolerated. So it has pretty good coverage. Your third generation cephalosporins definitely work. Omnicef and the one that all the research was actually done on, Suprax, uh, which is um, suffixime. Suprax in the liquid form, its biggest issue has been getting a hold of it. It comes on and off of availability all the time, and it's very expensive. Insurance companies don't want to pay for it, but it's definitely effective. Amoxclavulonic acid does work. That's augmentin for those of you out for those of you who speak name brand. Um, it does work. It has poor GI tolerability and doesn't always cover what what the kids have. Um, and it's very expensive. As far as how long to treat. 10 to 14 days. 
I tend to go with longer courses. Many physicians, myself included, want a test of cure when we're done. Because I see too many that fail, either because they failed to actually get the antibiotics, or because the antibiotics didn't work, or because there's a second organism because of an underlying anatomical problem. Uh, and then, obviously, the follow-up. As far as prophylaxis, what do you use? Well, everybody, it goes back to the same antibiotics that we're looking at here. Everybody has different choices. My personal preference is for macrobid, because although it's only bacteriostatic, not bactericidal, we're trying to prevent infection, not treat acute infection. So bacteriostatic is quite sufficient. And macrobid is something, although it is a, um, well, macrobit is something we don't use for anything else. And it's very well tolerated. It's stable for a month in solution. Um, whereas amoxicillin clavulanate, amoxicillin, Keflex, and third generation cephalosporins are only uh, stable in solution for 14 days. Um, macrobit is stable for 30 days. A lot of the urologists still prefer Bactrim for prophylaxis. Uh, this is stable for 30 days, too, and doesn't need to be refrigerated. In both of these cases, we're just giving it at bedtime for prophylaxis. Uh, I have my preferences to avoid Bactrim. I've seen too many cases of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, but there's definitely a role for that. Uh, another popular one is Keflex. Again, given just at bedtime, that's cephalexin, first generation cephalosporin. However, this is only stable in suspension for 14 days, and so you got to go to the pharmacy twice as often, making that a bit of a pain in the neck. And Macrobid being a bit of a pain in the neck, because it's not always commercially available as a liquid. Um, but Keflex does work. For the, the other issue with Keflex, of course, is we use it for lots of other things, and there's always the risk of uh, breeding resistance throughout the body. I know people that use amoxicillin for prophylaxis. Um, my theoretical concern there, again, is breeding resistance to amoxicillin, which is why I don't like to use it, but everybody has kind of their own values regarding this, and while it's based in science, there's no really distinct science surrounding it. Anyway, that's urinary tract infections. I'm Dr. Kevin Windish. I hope this has been educational for you and answers some of your questions. If I can be of assistance for future rotations, etc., please feel free to call my office, 775-359-7111. This, of course, is area code 775.